In this movie, we're going to discuss some of the effects of endocannabinoid signaling on a very simple circuit. We have now seen how endocannabinoids are generated in the postsynaptic cell, how they work by way of retrograde signaling by diffusing out of the postsynaptic cell backward to the presynaptic terminal, and how they suppress transmitter release by closing voltage-gated calcium channels. Here we will show how retrograde suppression of inhibition was actually demonstrated. We will then show how the suppression of inhibition in a simple circuit can enhance the effects of the excitatory innervation in postsynaptic cells. And finally, we will extend the basic findings to show how the suppression of inhibition could facilitate the production of long-term potentiation. The suppressive effects of endocannabinoid signaling were first shown by a phenomenon called depolarization-induced suppression of inhibition, which is quite a mouthful. But before describing depolarization-induced suppression of inhibition, I need to point out that in cortical and hippocampal cells, cannabinoid receptors, that is the CB1 receptors, are found only on the terminals of inhibitory neurons and not on excitatory neurons. In other areas of the brain, CB1 receptors are also found on excitatory cells, but not in the hippocampus and cortex. I will first describe the phenomenon itself and then describe the mechanisms that account for the results. OK, here's the circuit, and it's really simple. Recordings are obtained from a neuron in the cerebral cortex with an intracellular electrode. We're going to call this the postsynaptic neuron. And there are two inputs to the postsynaptic neuron, an excitatory input and an inhibitory input. However, the cell is bathed in a solution that blocks all of the excitatory synapses, as indicated by the X over the excitatory input. The inhibitory fiber, however, is spontaneously active so that the electrode records randomly occurring inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, or IPSPs, as shown in the bottom trace as brief downward deflections. The three red arrows point to three of the IPSPs. Next, what we do is strongly depolarize the cell by passing positive charges through the recording electrode for several seconds. After the injection of positive charges has stopped, the inhibitory fiber is still firing spontaneously, but for a period of about eight seconds, there are no IPSPs the inhibitory synapses are blocked due to the prior strong depolarization of the postsynaptic cell. As the, as the recording continues, the IPSPs begin to return, and after about 20 or 25 seconds, the inhibitory responses are as strong as they were before the postsynaptic cell was depolarized. The explanation for depolarization-induced suppression of inhibition is shown in this figure, in which I show the postsynaptic cell, as well as the excitatory and the inhibitory inputs to the cell. The excitatory inputs are blocked and are not functional. The inhibitory fibers, however, are spontaneously active and are evoking IPSPs. The IPSPs are shown in the lower left trace, where the two red arrows indicate two of the spontaneously evoked IPSPs. Now, endocannabinoids are generated by the influx of calcium allowed by a strong depolarization of the postsynaptic cell. The depolarization cannot be evoked by the excitatory synapses because they're blocked. The depolarization is evoked by passing positive charges through the recording electrode. 
The depolarization then opens voltage-gated calcium channels, and the influx of calcium triggers the synthesis of endocannabinoids from lipid precursors in the cell's membrane. The endocannabinoids then diffuse out of the postsynaptic cell and bind to the CB1 receptors on the axon terminal of the inhibitory neuron. The G protein coupled to the CB1 receptor is now activated, and a subunit of the G protein then binds onto the voltage-gated calcium channel in the axon terminal of the inhibitory cell and closes those calcium channels. Now there is no calcium influx into the axon terminals because the calcium channels are blocked. The effect of the blockage of the calcium channels is that the spontaneous firings of the inhibitory neuron no longer cause release of transmitter and thus no longer evoke IPSPs in the postsynaptic cell, as shown in the bottom trace. When the endocannabinoids diffuse off of the CB1 receptors, the calcium channels in the axon terminal are no longer blocked and become available. That is, they can again open to a depolarization, allowing for the influx of calcium and the release of transmitter. The inhibitory cell is still firing spontaneously, and since the synapse is now functional, IPSPs are again evoked in the postsynaptic cell. So the depolarization-induced suppression of inhibition is the 10 to 15 millisecond period following the strong depolarization, because during that period, the inhibitory inputs are blocked by the action of the cannabinoid receptors on the calcium channels in the axon terminal of the inhibitory cell. So in the next phase, we're going to remove the block from the excitatory synapse and make the excitatory synapse functional. We're then going to monitor the response in the postsynaptic cell when both the inhibitory and the excitatory fibers fire simultaneously. Then we're going to monitor the response in the postsynaptic cell when only the excitatory fiber fires strongly and generates the synthesis of an endocannabinoid. And then finally, we're going to monitor the change in the response of the postsynaptic cell when both the inhibitory and excitatory fibers again fire simultaneously, as they did previously in one above. So this is the first condition. The calcium channels on the inhibitory terminal are not blocked, and the inhibitory and excitatory fibers are now activated simultaneously. There is an influx of negative charges through the GABAergic inhibitory receptors and an influx of positive charges through the glutamatergic receptors on the postsynaptic cell. The influx of negative charges largely cancel the positive charges, thereby generating a weak response in the postsynaptic cell. In the second condition, the inhibitory fibers are inactive and only the excitatory fibers fire. Now the influx of positive charges through the excitatory glutamate receptors generates a large excitatory response in the postsynaptic cell. The response is large because the positive charges are unopposed by any influx of negative charges since the inhibitory fiber is not firing. The strong depolarization then opens voltage-gated calcium channels and the influx of calcium into the postsynaptic cell. The calcium influx triggers the synthesis of endocannabinoids from a lipid precursor in the membrane. The endocannabinoids then diffuse out of the postsynaptic cell to activate the CB1 receptors on the axon terminal of the inhibitory fiber. The activated G protein on the CB1 receptor then closes some, but not all, of the voltage-gated calcium channels on the axon terminal. So now we consider the third condition. 
Now some of the voltage-gated calcium channels on the inhibitory axon are closed for 10 or 15 seconds. During this 10 or 15 second period, the excitatory and inhibitory fibers again fire simultaneously. The influx of positive charges through the excitatory glutamatergic receptors is the same as it was previously. The important change is that since some of the voltage-gated calcium channels on the inhibitory terminal are closed, thus the action potential that invades the inhibitory terminal causes a much smaller release of transmitter than it did before the calcium channels were blocked. This results in a much smaller release of inhibitory transmitter and a much smaller influx of negative charges into the postsynaptic cell. Since the amount of positive charges entering the postsynaptic cell is unchanged, the smaller influx of negative charges causes only a small cancellation of the positive charges. The net result is a much larger response in the postsynaptic cell than was evoked by the simultaneous firing of the inhibitory and excitatory fibers before the closure of calcium channels in the inhibitory terminal. In other words, although the endocannabinoids did not change the strength of the excitatory synapse, it did weaken inhibition, and by so doing, the endocannabinoids acted to strengthen the response evoked by the entire circuit. Finally, we are going to change the excitatory synapse and add NMDA receptors, since almost all cortical and hippocampal cells have both AMPA and NMDA receptors in their postsynaptic membranes. There are the AMPA receptors, there are the NMDA receptors, and there is the magnesium plug in the pore of the NMDA receptor. Next, we excite both the inhibitory and excitatory fibers simultaneously, just as we had pre done previously. The response in the postsynaptic cell is weak because the inhibition largely cancels the excitation. The weak depolarization does not expel the magnesium ion from the pore of the NMDA receptor. Thus, there is no calcium influx through the NMDA receptors and long-term potentiation is not generated. In the final condition, some of the voltage-gated calcium channels on the inhibitory terminal have been blocked by the synthesis of endocannabinoids during previous activity in the circuit. Now, when both fibers are simultaneously activated, a larger response is generated in the postsynaptic cell because of the partial suppression of the inhibitory input due to the closure of some of the voltage-gated calcium channels on the inhibitory terminal. The stronger depolarization then expels the magnesium plug, allowing for the influx of calcium through NMDA receptors. The calcium influx at the synapse then activates CAM kinase 2 and triggers the cascade that inserts additional AMPA receptors into the synapse which strengthens the excitatory synapse. That strengthening is expressed as long-term potentiation, or LTP. So now we can appreciate the powerful influences that endocannabinoid signal, signaling can produce. In this case, even though the suppression of inhibition due to the endocannabinoid signaling lasts for only 10 to 20 seconds, the excitatory activity that occurs during that period is strong and can either generate or add to existing LTP effects. In either case, the activity evoked by the circuit is strengthened, and the strengthening due to long-term potentiation lasts for an hour or more. This is just one example that illustrates how the operations of the circuits in the brain can be complex and changeable with experience. The synapses in the brain are remarkably dynamic, but they have to be dynamic because the brain is the most complex piece of matter that we know of in the universe.